Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we're in the book of 1 Corinthians. We began a brand new study in the book of 1 Corinthians. So if you have a Bible, as always, follow along and we'll go through it verse by verse together. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, let's pray. Lord, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 begins, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. The very first thing that Paul does is establish his apostolic authority. He is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, didn't, he was not an apostle because he volunteered for the job. He wasn't an apostle because somebody told him that he was. He was an apostle because Jesus called him to be one. He didn't want to be one, but he was. He didn't even want to be a Christian until Jesus knocked him off his feet and revealed himself to him. You say, well, why, why was he so intent on, on establishing his apostolic authority? Because there were false teachers in Corinth who didn't believe that Paul was really an apostle because he wasn't one of the original twelve. Well, he was, and he had to establish his authority because he's writing the Word of God. And if you don't believe the Word of God is the Word of God, then it has no authority. But it is the Word of God, so it is authoritative. And the Apostle Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ, and he is establishing that authority right off the bat. So important, because one of Satan's tactics is to undermine the authority of God's Word. Because if he can get you to disbelieve the Word of God or question it, he's got you. Verse 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now, the Bible says here that we are sanctified. Christians are sanctified in Christ Jesus. To be sanctified means to be made holy. It means to be set apart for God. So in Christ Jesus, if you are a Christian, you are holy, you are set apart to God. It means that you're set apart with Jesus Christ unto God. And Apart from that, apart from being in Christ and sanctified in Him, none of us would be acceptable to God. Because you can't be good enough. You can't be sanctified enough on your own. The Bible says everyone has failed and fallen short of the glory of God. And sinned, I should say, and fallen short of the glory of God. So even a decent person cannot be decent enough to be accepted by God through their own merits. We have to be sanctified by Christ Jesus. That's what a Christian is. So you're a Christian, you're a saint, not because of what you do, but because of who you know. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you repented and asked Him to take control of your life and trusting Him for eternal life? If you haven't, you're not saved, you're not sanctified, you're not set apart for God, you're lost, you're on your way to hell. That is the teaching of Scripture. Verse 3, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Grace. Grace is God giving us something good that we do not deserve. And again, it's ours through Christ Jesus. We do not deserve to be forgiven. We do not deserve heaven. We do not deserve to be accepted by God. But God, through Jesus Christ, doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us what we don't deserve. The good things we don't deserve. The things mentioned. Eternal life. Forgiveness, heaven, in Christ, and only in Christ. Verse 4, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. So God had been very generous to the Corinthian Christians um, as far as spiritual gifts were concerned. And Paul thanked God for what he did in the lives of the Corinthians, in the Corinthian church. He was so grateful for what God did for them. That's the heart of a good man. That's the heart of a good Christian, right there. It is good to be happy 
for God's blessings on other people. A Christian who's walking in the Spirit is going to be happy for the good things that God has done for others. Verse 5, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. They were enriched in, uh, in utterance and in knowledge. So the, the church in Corinth understood many spiritual Jews. And they had many who could speak well, too. They were abundantly equipped to do the work of God. And of course, that is the case with all of us who know Christ. If God wants you to do something, then he's going to equip you to do it. You say, well, I don't think that I have the equipment for anything. You have the equipment to do what he wants you to do. Now, sometimes the equipment is there and it has to be prepared by practice or by study, but it's there. So if God wants to use us, then he will give us what we need to do his will. Verse 6, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, the evidence of Christ's presence and power was clearly seen in the Corinthian church. They were taking a public stand for Christ in the midst of a very vile city, city I should say, where sin was running rampant, where sin, the, the most gross sins imaginable, were the norm. And they were taking a stand. And you don't do that unless you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Fewer and fewer Christians are doing that today. Sad to say, fewer and fewer preachers are doing that today. They're not taking a stand against sin because it's so unpopular. Especially the sin of homosexuality. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Verse 7, So that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. They had all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In other words, they had the means to do the will of God. They had the means to do the work of God, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. They had plenty of spiritual equipment to do everything God wanted them to do as they waited for the return of Christ or until they went to, to be with Him. One way or another, they had everything that they needed to do everything that God wanted them to do. And again, God gives His people all that they need to do all that He wants them to do for as long as He wants them to do it. So I say, if you want to do something as a Christian, you want to do something, and you don't have what it takes at this time, then it's because God doesn't want you to do it. At least not right now He doesn't. Because if He did, then He would, he would, uh, he would have, you would have, I should say, whatever you would need to do it. So you've got to trust God in this one. Verse 8, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you've never read the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, then you can't really appreciate this verse. Because God says he's going to keep the Corinthians safe and blameless. And I was talking about spiritually safe, eternally safe, and blameless. Which means that salvation has to be by grace and can't possibly be based on human effort because there was a lot of sin in the Corinthian church and they were nowhere near good enough to be considered blameless by their own merits. Just a word about that word blameless. It doesn't mean sinless. God never promises to keep us sinless in this life, although that should be our goal. Because if you don't aim for something, you're not even going to get close. And second by second, as you're walking in the Spirit, you can be sinless. But God doesn't promise to keep us sinless in this life. However, He does promise, and this is great, that He's going to keep us blameless. He's going to keep us blameless. In other words, in Christ, He's not going to blame you for your sins. He says, you did wrong but I'm not going to hold that wrong against you. That's what it means to be blameless. And that's really the best that any of us can, can hope for, is blamelessness. Verse 9, God is faithful, 
by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so God invites us to be reconciled to him through his Son, Jesus Christ. He invites us to have fellowship with him through his Son, Jesus Christ. Why through his Son, Jesus Christ? Because Jesus is the only one who paid for our sins and you can't have fellowship with God unless your sins are paid for. So it's only through Jesus Christ that you can enjoy God's presence. Verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, God isn't saying, when he says you have to speak the same things, he doesn't, you know, you have to mimic each other. He's not saying that. You have to say exact the same thing all the time. Not talking about that at all. What he is saying is that you better agree on the things that are essential as Christians. Speak the same things. Don't be divided. And if you do have disagreements in certain areas that are not crystal clear in Scripture, then be gracious about it. Truth should never be watered down in order to get along with those who oppose truth which is going on today. You, you don't need to get along with somebody who opposes the crystal clear teaching of the Word of God. But for the sake of harmony, there should be grace and there should be flexibility among Christians concerning the non-essential teachings. Again, concerning those teachings that are not crystal clear in the Word of God. Such as, such as some of the end time events. We know that Jesus is returning. We know that he's returning physically. We know that there's going to be a judgment. We know that there's going to be a heaven for those who reject, for those who receive Christ, a hell for those who reject Christ. We know all those things because the Bible is crystal clear on that. But the, the minute details are not that crystal clear. And good Christians who love Jesus and love the Word of God can have honest disagreements about that. And that's what he's talking about. At least be gracious concerning these things. These guys are not too gracious. Verse 11, For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them who are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. They're arguing. And Paul's upset that they're arguing. But, did you notice how he still calls them brothers? The apostle is being kind, even as he deals with their sin. God wants Christians to be kind to each other. And if you're going to disagree with something, again, that's not clear in the Word of God, then do it in a loving way. Disagree over issues if you have to, but try to respect one another. Twelve. But this is what they were talking, this is what they were disagreeing about. They were contentious, contentious over this. Look at verse 12. Now this I say, that every one of you says, I am of Paul, or I of Apollos, or I of Cephas, or I of Christ. In other words, the Corinthian Christians were picking sides. They were picking sides. They were following human leaders. And then arguing about which human leader was the best. A complete and total unbiblical waste of time. Thirteen. Paul goes on to say, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of, the, of the name of Paul? In other words, why are you identifying yourself with me and others for that matter? The Apostle Paul didn't die for anyone's sins. Why are you saying, I am of Paul? No one was baptized into the name of the Apostle Paul. Paul had nothing in the world to do with saving anyone's soul from hell. So why were some of the Corinthians following him? Or for why were they following any other human leader for, leader for that matter? Or teacher? Why? Does it make sense? It is wrong to be identified with a man as a Christian, or a woman for that matter. I would be ashamed if someone thought, if somebody identified me as a follower of another human being, I don't care what kind of a Christian they were. I would be ashamed and, and embarrassed if somebody thought I was a follower of a human being. 
I want my identity to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's it. I may not follow him perfectly. I wish I followed him better. Believe me, I do. But I am a follower of Jesus Christ. That's where my identity is. I don't follow anyone, and I certainly don't want anyone following me, please. We need to listen to good Bible teachers, and we need to measure everything that they say and teach by the one who we should follow, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ and the written Word of God. That's who we should follow, and we do it by following His Word. 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. When the Apostle says, I thank God that I baptized none of you, he's not downplaying the importance of baptism, as some would suggest. He's simply saying that he's glad that he didn't personally baptize any of them, because they would probably think that that would be a reason to follow him. Whenever the focus is on a human being, even a faithful servant of Jesus Christ, instead of on Jesus himself, the focus is wrong. 16. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptize any other. So, you know, as, as Paul is discussing the uh, issue of baptism, he suddenly remembers, as he's talking, that some, there was somebody else that he baptized, the household of Stephanus lesson for us here. Sometimes talking about an issue helps to clarify our mind on that particular issue. That's in part what is meant when the Bible says iron sharpens iron. As we talk with other Christians about the Bible, God can crystallize truth for us. 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. The Apostle Paul, he was a very highly educated man. Today we would say he's got a lot of degrees. And he studied at the best schools. But he kept his teaching simple. His teaching was very plain. He didn't use big words. He didn't want big words and high-sounding ideas to distract listeners or readers from the simple message of the cross. And it is simple. He didn't want anyone to be impressed with his vocabulary or his intellect. Again, the focus should never be on the preacher, but on Jesus Christ and the Word of God. And anything said or done in order to draw attention to self should be confessed as sin because that's what it is. Some preachers use the pulpit as a, as a means to draw attention to themselves, to be cute, to be entertainers, whatever. All these things are wrong. Verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The idea that Almighty God would send His Son and that His Son would volunteer, volunteer to come and die on the cross to pay for our sin, that is a silly, stupid idea to those who are on their way to hell. Do you think that idea is silly? Do you think that idea is stupid? Do you think it's ridiculous that God would send his son and that Jesus would have to die on the cross to pay for your sin? Do you think that's stupid? Then God warns. The reason you think that is because you are lost. You are spiritually dead. You are on your way to hell. You better repent. He's warning you. He's saying as far as people like that are concerned, it's a waste of time to, to listen to some nonsense or that nonsense. And of course, that's also why they're on their way to hell, because they're not listening to the Word of God. It's foolishness to them. But to those of us who believe, the cross of Jesus Christ is the power of God for salvation, because that's where Jesus paid for our sins. Verse 19, 
For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. The intellectual crowd, who like to use terms such as I think, I believe, or may I suggest to you, and then through those words communicate their own, their own made up plans of salvation, completely ignoring the cross, they will see that all their plans will fail. Not one of them will save one single soul, but will in fact lead souls to hell. God ignores the ideas that people devise as a means of eternal salvation. He's already devised one. It's his son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross. Notice verse 20 continues. Where, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? The best plans on how to obtain eternal life that the scholars and the debaters of this world come up with are pure nonsense to God. They are nonsense to God because that's what they are, nonsense. And someday everyone will know it. When it becomes clear that no one who follows those plans will go to heaven, but all will go to hell, everyone will see that those plans, as high sounding, as sophisticated as they sounded, were nothing but nonsense, verbal trash. 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. God did two things. He made sure that no one would escape hell by devising their own plan, no matter how sophisticated and complicated it seemed. And he came to man's rescue himself by saving everyone who would believe his word and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So he didn't leave man hanging out there just because they couldn't figure out a, a, a plan that would save themselves from hell. He didn't leave them hanging. You're too stupid. You can't figure it out. Well, then go to hell. No, he devised a simple plan. Simple for us to understand. 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. God did two things, as I said. He made sure that no one's going to be saved by their own sophisticated plan or by somebody else's sophisticated plan. And he performed the... Uh, the thing that was needed to be done for salvation himself by becoming a man and dying on the cross to pay for our sins. And the job is done, the work is done by Jesus, and now he saves people. How? He tells us right here, by the preaching of the Word of God. Preaching, you know what preaching is? A lot of people have no idea what preaching is anymore. Preaching is boldly proclaiming the written Word of God. Preaching is speaking the truth of God's word with authority, the authority of God. And many people don't like to hear preaching today. It's looked down upon, oh, he's kind of preachy. Well, if he's preaching the word of God, he should be preachy. And this is true, especially in evangelical churches. So many of them have become so lukewarm. People don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear preaching. You know what they... They roll their eyes. They snicker. Ah, oh, this is too old-fashioned. Truth be known, it's not too old-fashioned. Truth be known, they're too look, lukewarm. That's the problem. And so the straightforward word of God makes them uncomfortable. And that's the real reason they don't like it. It's not because it's old-fashioned. It's the word of God. They're just so lukewarm that they can't take it. They don't... People want their pastor to share. Our pastor's going to share the Word of God. He shares with us. And embedded in that Word is the idea of never calling sin, sin. Never mentioning hell. Never mentioning Satan. Never mentioning repentance, unless you kind of snicker. And you, and you preface your remarks by saying, well, now, I don't want to be a Bible banger. Why? Because you're sharing. 
And that's what people are comfortable with, sharing, not preaching. They want their pastor to tell stories. They want their pastor to impress with big words. They want their pastor to entertain them by being cute. Well, our pastor's really good. He's really good. He's so funny. You know, he tells so many neat stories. He's really good. All oh, the sermons over there, they're really good. Means he entertaining. Sophisticated. Completely unlike the Apostle Paul and the other apostles. Very few will tolerate a preacher who opens the Bible and boldly says, Thus says the Lord God. But you know what? If the Word of God is not spoken with authority, you know why people don't get saved in those churches? Or with those ministries? is because the Word of God is not spoken with authority. And if you don't speak the Word of God with authority, oh, it's true, no one's going to get angry. But no one's going to get saved. And no Christian's going to really be edified either. So what's the point? Why don't you just stay home? And if you're a preacher who does it, why don't you just quit? Quit. Please, just quit. And do something else. 22. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Greeks were the intellectuals of the day. All well, they wanted to be saved by understanding high-sounding, complicated Philosophical ideas, that's what really appealed to them. We can be saved by understanding those things. That's what they thought. In fact, their attitude was the first one to come up with a complicated plan using big words that no one understands wins. And then on the other hand, you had the Jews who were always wanting a, a fresh miracle to prove that Jesus was the Savior and there just wasn't enough miracles in the world to prove that. So, that's what the Greeks wanted, that's what the intellectuals wanted, that's what the Jews wanted. So what did the Apostle Paul and the other Apostles give them? Well, look at 23. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Gentiles foolishness. He didn't care what the people wanted. Do you think the Apostle Paul would ever do what some churches do today? You know, people start a new church and what do they do? They send out flyers and questionnaires to their community. Asking them what, the, asking a bunch of unsaved people what they want in a church. And then that's what they do in their worship services. What is that? That's, that's a club. That's not a church. You think the Apostle Paul would ever do that? Obviously not. He preached what Jesus told him to preach. He preached the pure word of God, period. If you don't like it, then go get your entertainment someplace else. Not in the business to build a ministry. Not in the business to build a church. They're in the business of preaching the word of God from Genesis through Revelation, the whole counsel of God, as Paul did. And that those who are hungry have something that they can cling to. Those who aren't, well, they can just go their own way. But don't give them more entertainment, for goodness sake. The world doesn't need more entertainment. We preach Christ crucified. That's what he preached. And there's nothing complicated about God's plan of salvation because he tells us what it is right here. In a nutshell, Jesus died to save us from hell. That's it. But the Jews and the Greeks didn't believe the word of God. You know, it offended their pride to think that their only hope was for their creator to become a man and die a horrible death on the cross to pay for their sin. That was really offensive to them. And it's the same today. I've, I've met people like this. There are some who refuse to believe that there isn't a system that will get them into heaven without being so degrading to them. You mean the Son of God had to come and die for my sin? Well, I'm not that bad. And they just refuse to believe it. But there is no plan. There is no system. There is no complicated intellectual ladder that will get anyone into heaven. It's just not there. The death of Jesus on the cross, which paid for our sin, is the only plan, period. Repent, receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, or go to hell. Those are your choices. There are no other choices. That's it. We're going to stop for today.